Last week, of course, uh, lesson number six, and in the first part of that lesson, we reviewed the uh, Martin Luther film, and then in the second part of it, of course, we began looking at the fact that Jesus is true God and true man, looked at the scriptures which point to that, and uh, looked at several scriptures to point that out, and, and he is indeed true God and true man, and there's many ways in which that is brought out in the scriptures. In other words, we looked at passages which talk about the wisdom of God and the authority of God, which belongs to Jesus too, how he performed the works of God in so many different ways, and um, how he forgave sins, all of these things that most certainly uh, the scriptures say that he was the uh, the Son of God come into this world, and the second person of the Trinity, and we believe that. The Creed points this out to us. Now, if you've got your catechism there, let me ask you to turn to the second article of the Creed, and uh, that's on, in, in my little catechism here, that's on page 8. And we can look at that second article, and uh, which we confess uh, in the Apostles' Creed, and we can see how it points us to the fact that Jesus is indeed true God and true man. So, do you have that on page 8 or whatever it is in your little catechism? I don't know what page it is. Is it on page 8? Seven. 7. Page 7 in your little catechism. But look at it then. It says, uh, And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. But right off, you see, it says, And in Jesus Christ, his only Son. Now remember that we said the name Jesus points us to the fact that he is true man. The word Christ points us to the fact that he was true God. Huh? His only son. Those words would point to the fact that he is true what? God. Huh? And in Jesus Christ, his only son. That's pointing to the fact that he is true God. Our Lord, of course, that would point to the fact that he is true God, who was conceived. The word conceived would point to the fact that he is true man, yes. But by the Holy Spirit, that would point to the fact that he is true God. huh? Born of the Virgin Mary, born, of course, would point to the fact that he is true Man of the Virgin Mary would point to the fact that he is true God. Suffered under Pontius Pilate. Suffered would point to the fact that he is true man. Huh? Yes. Was crucified and was buried. All of those words point to the fact that he was true man. Huh? The rest now, of course, point to the fact that he is true God descended into hell, third day arose again from the dead, ascended into heaven, and so on. In all of those phrases, he is both true man and true God, but that's pointing to the fact especially that he is true God now and uh, resurrected and so on. But those passages point us to the fact that he is true man and true God. Now, remember on the board I, I wrote last week that the, I wrote the name Jesus up there and I wrote the name the Christ up there, and I said the name Jesus points us to the fact that he is true what? Man. And also the word Christ points us to the fact that he is true God. Let me do that again so you can get this down. True Jesus, the Christ. The word Christ is not his last name. That's not a surname. But this identifies him. See, Jesus, of course, points us to the fact that he is true God. And points us to the fact that he has a divine, he has a human, a human nature. Okay? Human being with a human nature. And the word Christ, of course, points us to the fact that he is true God. And he has a divine nature. Okay? We stress that so much because there are so many in the world who deny that he is true God. They'll accept this part over here, that he was true man and of divine nature, I mean of human nature. But this over here, no, they don't accept that. that that's just impossible. That could not be. Now, the word Christ, of course, remember, is the Greek word for anointed. 
and he's anointed by the Holy Spirit, set aside for the work of being our prophet, priest, and king. The word Messiah, of course, is the Hebrew word, remember? Messiah means Hebrew. And in the Old Testament, they're looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. When he comes, of course, he, he comes into this world as the anointed one, the Son of God. But he is then the Christ because that's another language, Greek. But he is true God and he is true man. Now, just how human was he? How human was he? Well, we say, of course, that he was born, he faced temptation, all of those kind of things, but he was truly a human being in every respect. Look at Philippians chapter 2 verse 5. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5, and let's see, that's on page, chapter 2 verse 5 is on page 981. Philippians chapter 2 verse Five. In fact, it's on page uh, 980. That's where verse 5 is and it goes on after that. Do you have it? 980, chapter 2, verse 5. This is what Paul is talking about, his being true man, true or true God. Leah, are you looking up, you guys back there in the Bible? Okay, be sure and look up back, look this up. Chapter 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father." What the Apostle Paul was doing here was pointing us, of course, to the human nature of Christ. And uh, he was also um, uh, pointing out that how he was a servant. Uh, Paul, in this particular passage in Philippians, here is kind of scolding the Philippians because uh, uh, they had a hard time in Philippi uh, being uh, or taking on the role of servants. And so he's pointing to the fact Jesus, who was true God, came into this world, became a human being, and became a servant. You know, the Philippi, of course, was a Roman colony for retired Roman soldiers. And uh, that's what the city was known for. And Rome had established this city for, the doing, for, for that very purpose. And uh, Philippi was a little Rome in itself. Rome, uh, even though it was in the northern Greece, it uh, still uh, had, uh, was culturally Roman and, and so on and so forth. But here was lots of Roman soldiers retired there. And um, they were not given to servanthood. You know, it's pretty hard if you're a colonel and army and that kind of thing, and you've been uh, ordering men around for a long time. It's kind of hard just to assume the role of a servant now and work in servant roles. And so Paul is, said, is talking to these folks and about being servants and, and uh, doing the work of servant following the Lord Jesus. And that's why he writes the way he does. Then look at it again, verse 5. Who... Have this mind among you. Think this way. This is how you are to think. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, he's God himself, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant coming into this world, being born in the likeness of men. Here's God himself lowering himself down into this world to become a servant of men. And being found in human form, this is how he humbled himself. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the worst of all deaths, death on a cross, the most ignominious type of death in that day. He lowered himself to become to die even the death of a cross. Now God has highly raised him up. But what is, point Paul, what is point Paul pointing to then is how our Lord was indeed a human being, became a man, lowered himself into this world. How low did he become him? How low did he make himself? Well, his story is really a story of, of riches to rags, huh? 
because he's coming from the riches and glory of heaven to this earth, uh, to a life of poverty and so on and so forth. But think about how low he lowered himself. Um, where was he born? Bethlehem. In Bethlehem, yes. In a what? A in a stable, yes. Not in the home of rich folks. Huh? Born in a stable. Who was his first admirers? Or who were his first worshipers? Kings and queens? No. Who? Shepherds. Yes, yeah, shepherds. So his first admirers were shepherds. The lowest level of society, you see. My goodness, this is the very bottom of society. Shepherds come to worship him. Raised where? Huh? In Nazareth, right. Raised in Nazareth. And when Nathaniel first heard that he was from Nazareth, what did Nathaniel say? Nathaniel couldn't believe it. He said, he's the Messiah, and he comes from Nazareth. And Nathaniel says, what good has ever come out of Nazareth? And my goodness, why would anyone be raised in Nazareth? Yes, no reason. Nothing of any importance had ever happened in Nazareth in history. There's lots and lots of towns, hundreds in the Old Testament, uh, named, uh, I mean, in Israel, named in the Old Testament. N Nazareth is not named. In the Old Testament, nothing of any importance had ever happened there. And so Nathaniel says, my goodness, raised in Nazareth, why would God pick a place like Nazareth for the Messiah to come from? Yes, so he becomes a lowly man, huh? And he comes into this world. He lays aside his divine glory, lays aside his divine power, all of those things. Once in a while, that power would shine through. And once in a while, that glory would shine through. And when it did, we called those what? Miracles, huh? Yes, once in a while. Wedding of Cana, stilling of the storm, all of those. Otherwise, you would have never known that he was the Lord himself come. Once in a while, though, that glory and power came through, and then we would call those miracles. How human was he? Uh, did he cry? Yeah. Sure he did, at the tomb of Lazarus, huh? Cried. Coming into Jerusalem at the end, wept over Jerusalem. Why did he weep over Jerusalem? Because he knew that Jerusalem was going to reject him, and that judgment eventually would come upon Nazareth, I mean, Jerusalem because of that. So he wept because Jerusalem was turning down salvation, broke his heart. That these, God's people, were turning down the gift of salvation, yes. Ever get hungry? Sure, in the desert he's hungry, huh? The devil tries to get him to make stones into bread. While he and the disciples are traveling through uh, Samaria, one day uh, they stop and, and uh, the disciples go into town to get some food. He stays out of town by the well, and there he meets a lady whom he speaks to about the uh, living water and brings her to faith in Jesus. Feel pain? Sure, felt pain, didn't he? Yes. And die? Yes, indeed. On a cross. 100% man, 100% God. Hmm. So that at Christmas, the Son of God, true God, entered into a man or was born a man, I should say that. That's already happened, of course, at his conception. But these two natures then are joined and they are never again separated. Never again separated. So he is tempted just like uh, we are. And that's also brought out. And look at Hebrews chapter 4 to see where they, the writers bring this out. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Because it wants us to point that, wants to point this point us to that to again show us just how human he was. Chapter 4, verse 14. Would you look at that? That's on page 1003. 1003. Chapter 4, verse 14. 1003. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then, be, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, 
that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Our high priest, of course, is Jesus. He has passed through the heavens. He has ascended back into heaven. But he is the Son of God. He is the Son of God. And he's been here. And he knows what living in this world is all about. That's why the writer says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. My goodness, like I said, he's been here. He knows what life is about. Who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one to sympathize but we do have a high priest who is unable, let me go back again. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are. The devil was constantly at him by the world too, and yet never once did he give in. He did not sin. So, but he had to struggle with that just like we do. And he had to overcome that just like we do with God's word. And you see that out in the, um, out in the wilderness. Well, his coming into this world and his living in this world, we term that his, the state of humiliation. The state of humiliation. That he humbled himself, he lowered himself to come into the world. And the creed then points that out to us by these words that we've looked at just a moment ago. But we can put it on steps going down like this. Like these steps going down are the state of humiliation. The state of humiliation. The first step in that lowering down process was this, that he was conceived by the Holy Ghost. The second step then would be what? That he was born of the Virgin Mary. The third step would be that he was, he suffered under Pontius Pilate, that he was crucified, that he died, and that he was buried. And so those six steps, one, two, three, four, five, six, those six steps down are called the state of humiliation. And you can see how they go down. Finally, it ends up in a tomb, comes into this world conceived, is born into this world through a mother's womb, and goes through all of this, which is all part of that lowering down for us and our salvation, and finally ends up buried in a tomb. And what we're going to do today is we're going to look at all of these points here. And then in next week, we will look at the steps going back up again. But the state of humiliation, that is what this is called. He is conceived, he is born, he has died, he is buried, all of those things. Now, he is born of a woman, but the Bible maintains that he is holy and that he is without sin. And that's pointed out to us in Luke. And so would you please look at Luke. Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1 in your Bible. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. Chapter 1, verse 26. Chapter 20, or chapter 1, verse 26. This is a scripture that we hear at the beginning of Advent. But chapter 1, verse 26. Do you have it? In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was, was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. To a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled by this saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. 
And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How can this be? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who is called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now, that whole story is in the creed under these words, conceived by the Holy Spirit. What was the Lord doing when when his son is conceived by the Holy Spirit, why is this so? What is he protecting him from? Original. original sin. Do you see? He's protecting him from original sin. You know, we, when we studied sin, we studied original sin. That is that sin that has been passed down to us from Adam and Eve. It is that sin which, of course... Uh, uh, we, with which we are infected, of course, and which means death for us, because that's what that's all about. That we are born sinners. Uh, we are born with original sin. We are born headed for death. We are born uh, separated from God. All of those kind of things. We are born with original sin. Now that comes to us, of course, from our parents and all the way down from Adam and Eve. Now, our Lord must be protected from that. And his protection from that is through the virgin conception. He is conceived by the Holy Spirit. Hmm. So, do you notice that? Look at that, and you can see it here in, in the text. The angel comes, and Mary can't believe this. My goodness, why has she been picked out like this? But look at what the angel says. This is, this is so unique. The angel, first of all, in verse uh, 28 says, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. And she's scared, greatly troubled. She's scared to death. And she's trying to figure out what this is all about and what it means. And then the angel begins talking to her. Don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you're going to conceive in your womb and bear a son. And you shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great and he'll be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom and of his kingdom will be no end. And it's like the angel starts talking. And the angel just talks and talks and talks. And he's just going on and going on and explaining. And finally, Mary kind of throws up her arms and he says, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's a problem here. And Mary said, how will this be since I am a virgin? How can this be? I've been thinking that you're telling me. And then the angel finally gets down to the details and it explains the Holy Spirit, the angel says, will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Now, the angel simply, he really doesn't explain anything. He simply says, this is going to be a miracle of the Holy Spirit. He's going to come upon you and make this happen. But this is why. He doesn't go into an explanation of the, he doesn't explain the how of it, but he explains the why of it. And the why of it is this, that you shall be called, that he shall be called holy, the Son of God. That's the way the scripture does with all kinds of miracles. As you go through the miracles of the scriptures, you know, they're not interested and they do not explain the why of the miracles. They simply tell you the why of the miracles, not the how, but the why. You know, that's the difference between Greek thinking and Hebrew thinking. Greek thinking was always asking, how did this happen? You see, there's very scientific and very investigative. And the Hebrews are asking, why? Why did it happen? Because... They see God at work in our world and everything, and they're always asking, you know, what, what's God saying to us? What's happening? How is God involved here? And what's he trying to show us? And those kind of things. So, you know, uh, the Greeks would come to a miracle and say, how, what in the world? How did that happen? And the Hebrews would come to the same miracle and say, why? What does that mean? And they would find God's word speaking to them. Well, here, the angel explains, in a sense, but not really, Holy Spirit's going to come upon you, and for this reason, that that son might be called holy, 
and might be the Son of God. And then she tells him, and then the angel tells her about Elizabeth. Mary finds this hard to believe, and then the angel says, but your, your cousin Elizabeth <clears throat> is also going to have a baby, and she's way past the age, and God has done something wondrous there, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary surrenders, then she says, well, I don't understand, but uh, I'm a servant of the Lord, and I'm ready to receive that which he would ordain in my life. Well, that's the story from Mary's point of view. You know, the Christmas story is in the Bible twice. And in Luke, it is there from Mary's point of view. And in Matthew, it is there from Joseph's point of view. So let's, let's, let's look back at Matthew then, chapter 1, verse 18. And look at this same event from Matthew's are from uh, Joseph's point of view. We've looked at it from Mary's point of view, now from Joseph's point of view. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Verse 18, okay? By the way, those first 18 verses, uh, Mr. Cohen last week speaking to us uh, referred to those, uh, you know, he says you begin reading the, Old, the, the New Testament, and all you do is you find all this big long list of names. But he says, in that list of names is a history of Israel. And all those names are getting ready for the coming of the Messiah, the Savior. So go down to verse 18. Got it? Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband... Notice it's called husband. Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins." And all this took place to fulfill what the, prophet, what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus." This is quite a picture of Joseph and uh, from, uh, of the birth of Jesus from Joseph's point of view. First of all, it tells you what? The birth of Jesus took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found. Betrothed was this. Betrothed was uh, this. And what it's telling you is that, uh, you know, they picked out uh, in those days, parents picked out uh, uh, the spouses for their children. And so what it's telling you there is that uh, Joseph's father had gone down to see uh, Mary's father. And uh, they had known each other through the years in this little uh, town. And uh, he goes down, he says, I've been watching your daughter Mary, and I think she's a sweet girl. And she's, I'd like her, for, like her to be the wife of my son, Joseph. And... Uh, and um, Mary's dad says, you know, and I've been kind of following Joseph, too, through the years. And I think he's a fine young man. He'd make a good husband for my, uh, for my daughter. Now, but uh, now we have to work out the, the, the dowry. And uh, Joseph's dad would think, uh, say, you know, what, uh, what, do you, what, what kind of ideas do you have uh, in terms of dowry? And uh, Joseph's dad would, uh, Mary's dad would say, well, you know, I, I really think probably uh, three lambs and... Uh, and uh, some chickens and so on and so forth. And, and uh, Joseph's dad would say, man, that's a, little, that's a little steep. I don't know that we can afford three lambs, maybe two lambs, something like this. But they're going to dick her back and forth. And they're going to uh, figure this all out. And then they're going to arrive at proper dowry. dowry and uh, Joseph's dad is going to pay that dowry and take it down to Mary's dad. And, and at that point, they will be betrothed. At that point... In the language of that day, now they have not come together, so there has not been, there's been no, uh, uh, that has not come about yet. But, um, but they are still husband and wife. 
in the language of that day. So that if Joseph dies in this year of betrothal, and it is a year of betrothal, if he should die during that year, um, Mary is his widow, and he, she inherits. So that once they are betrothed, if Joseph should die, lots of people died young in those days, if Joseph should die, then Mary would inherit anything that Joseph had. They are betrothed. Now, they've not come together yet. Um, the, the marriage has not been consummated yet, but that will come later. But now, so the betrothal has taken place. Now, now, now think of this. Now Mary has to come to him, and she says, has to come to him, and she has to say, Joseph, I'm pregnant. And my goodness, he is just shattered by this. My goodness, I thought you were true to me, and I thought we were engaged, and all these things you see, and how in the world could you do this? And then she comes up with this fantastic story. Well, an angel appeared to me, and uh, I'm going to give birth to the Messiah, to the Savior, to that one that God has been promising for centuries. And Joseph listens to all of that, and what? Shakes his head. This is about the craziest story I've ever heard. Now think of Mary, too. She has to tell her parents that, doesn't she? How do they accept it? They don't. She has to tell her grandparents, huh? Yes, all of those people. It's quite a story, isn't it? Quite a story. And who believes her? Not really anybody. They all doubt. There's one person who believes her, though. And that's why she takes off to go see her. And that's Elizabeth. Elizabeth. She goes to see Elizabeth. Elizabeth has now experienced also a miracle from God, and she will believe Mary. And Mary spends about three months with Elizabeth, and then comes back. But anyway, it also tells you something about Joseph, what he does. Does he believe or no? Look at verse 19. And Joseph, her husband, being a just man, he's a good man, good man, got a good heart, and unwilling to put her to shame. What's that mean? Resolved to divorce her quietly. That means this, that in those days there was two ways of divorcing. Legally, he could have taken her into court and said she has committed adultery, she has, uh, uh, she's pregnant by another man, and therefore uh, her dad has to pay back the dowry. But Joseph decides not to do that. He simply is going to hand her just a little piece of paper which says, I divorce you in the presence of one witness, and it will be over with. And who cares about the dowry? So that's what it's telling you there. It's telling you Joseph is not concerned about the dowry. He's not going to do that. He's not going to mess with that. He is not going to shame Mary. He's not going to bring her into court. Uh, that dowry doesn't mean that much. And he's not going to bring her into court. He's not going to shame her. He's not going to have to have any testimony and all that kind of stuff. It's going to be done very quietly, see? Resolve to, divide, to divorce her quietly. And what that would mean then, that he'll divorce her quietly and probably she will leave town and uh, have the baby someplace else and uh, who knows that she'll ever get back to, to Nazareth again. But that's what he's going to do. He has struggled with this and, and he just can't bring himself to, to marry her now, to consummate that marriage. But as they considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary, your wife. She's telling you the truth. That which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit, and she will bear a son, and you are to call his name Jesus. And here's why. He will save his people from their sins. He is indeed whom the angel said to her he would be. He is the Savior. Now, then Matthew, who is writing his gospel for Jewish people, points them to an Old Testament passage which says this is going to be, and he says this is fulfilled. Matthew says, Isaiah wrote, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. There it's pointing to the fact that he is true God and true man. And Joseph wakes up and uh, takes her as wife, but notice what it says, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. She is the Virgin Mary until that baby is born. And that's what it's pointing out and wants 
uh, what Matthew wants the readers to realize. That she is born, that he is indeed conceived in a miraculous way. It is, it is a virgin conception, but also a virgin birth. Now, at this point, we have to say something about Mary, because this is one of the points in which we really differ with the Roman Catholic Church in our time. The Roman Catholic Church sees Mary quite differently than uh, Protestants uh, see her. In the Roman Catholic Church, it is believed that, a Mar that Mary herself, for instance, is of immaculate conception. Maybe you've heard that word. Some Catholic churches are called uh, the Church of the Immaculate Conception. But in 1854, 1854, the Pope said this is truth that must now be believed by every Roman Catholic person or every person who wants to be saved, that Mary had an immaculate conception. What that means is that her conception was immaculate. The Lord cleansed her conception and made it an immaculate conception so that she was born without sin, that Mary herself was never touched by original sin, that, uh, that the Lord spared her that, and she was born without original sin. That uh, in 18, December the 8th, December the 8th, 1854, Pope Pius XI, uh, said this, that at the first instance of her conception was preserved, at the first instant of her conception, she was preserved immaculate from all stain of original sin by the singular grace and privilege granted her by Almighty God through the merits of Christ Jesus, Savior of mankind. That's December the 8th, 1854. The Pope, of course, when he makes a doctrinal, uh, pronouncements is considered infallible. And that was in 1850 when that was decided. So that Mary, Mary was without sin. Um, we, of course, do not believe that at all. In fact, the reason why we don't believe it is because of what she says to Elizabeth. Look back at Luke, then, would you please? Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter, two, well, Luke chapter 1, I believe it is. Let me look. Luke chapter 1, look back at that, would you please? When Mary goes to see Elizabeth. Yes. Chapter 1, verse 46. Chapter 1, verse 46. Mary goes to see Elizabeth. It's quite a journey from Nazareth uh, down into Judea, into the mountainous area. She was quite a woman. You have to say that about her. Very young, probably 15 years old. But look what she says. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. But she calls God her Savior. And what that tells us is that she recognized herself as a sinner and she sees God as her savior because only sinners need a savior. You know, in the Bible, for instance, angels never speak of God in terms of savior. God is Lord. As you read in Revelation and so on, the angels do not call God savior because he is not the savior of the angels. Angels are not sinners and therefore they do not need a savior. They need a Lord, and they have a Lord, and that's what, you, that's what the Lord is to them. But Mary here uh, needs a savior, and she recognizes this, and she confesses this. So that's one thing that we do not, uh, that we look at, you know, and say, no, that immaculate conception, there's nothing in the scriptures that would ever indicate that in any kind of way. But, uh, <sighs> They use the argument, the Catholics use the argument that, uh, my goodness, if you had the power to spare your mother of original sin, wouldn't you do it? Well, that's a nice, reasonable argument, but it's not, it is not scriptural again. So 1854, the Immaculate Conception. And it is because of this and because of also another doctrine, which was pronounced in 1950. This is a pretty recent one. That Mary was assumed. And this is called the Assumption of Mary. The Assumption of Mary. 
And what that means is that Mary herself did not die. God took her to heaven bodily, that she did not have to go through death, that she was simply assumed or taken bodily into heaven, like Elijah was in the Old Testament. And that was now pronounced doctrine that has to be believed for salvation in 1950. You know, I can still remember, of course, when that uh, came out and when that happened. And uh, there was lots of uh, debate about that, even within the Roman Catholic Church. You know, can that really be so and so on? And um, not all Catholics even agreed at that point. But once the Pope said, this is so and this is truth and this must be believed, that ends the argument. And uh, that is then taught too. So we've kind of... Uh, so it's the assumption of the Virgin Mary. Now, it is because of those two things, those two big um, uh, doctrines, that in the Catholic Church, of course, people pray to Mary. And there is the Hail Mary, and perhaps you've heard that. And uh, it is encouraged to pray to Mary, and people pray the Hail Mary. They pray the Rosary, of course. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Well, we do not pray to the Virgin Mary because she's just uh, she's a, a, a sinner like us. And she died and she went to heaven, certainly believing in her son. But uh, she does not hear prayer. She does not answer prayer. Uh, and uh, besides, we do not need anyone to, to pray for us. We can go directly to the Lord ourselves. We go to the Lord Jesus ourselves. He is our intercessor. There is nothing in the scripture at all that says that, Jesus, that Mary is our intercessor. In fact, it speaks of Jesus as our intercessor and calls him our intercessor, which means he is the one who prays for us, not Mary. So... To pray to the Virgin Mary is just, um, well, it's a waste of time. Uh, very, you know, very truthful, very blunt. Uh, it's a waste of time. Uh, to pray to any of these saints, of course. It is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who hear prayer and answer prayer. And uh, all of those, even though the church, uh, the Roman Catholic Church may say that uh, you have all these saints who hear prayer and answer prayer, there's not one uh, bit of evidence in the scripture. How did Mary become this uh, person to whom we pray? Well, it was this here too. Because when you look at her in the scriptures, there's five times when she is mentioned. Of course, the birth of Jesus and uh, also when Jesus is um, uh, um, at the temple when he's 12 years old and the wedding of Cana, of course. One other time she comes to visit uh, him. And, uh, and then uh, after um, uh, at the two, at the uh, at the cross, mentioned there too. And the last time that you hear of her, she uh, is in the book of Acts, and she's in the upper room. And that's between the period of the Ascension and Pentecost, and she's there with the disciples praying in the upper room. And that's the last time you hear of Mary in the scriptures. The Apostle Paul never says anything about her. Uh, Peter says nothing about her. John says nothing about her. None of the other biblical writers ever say anything about Mary. She simply drops out of the picture. Uh, Joseph drops out of the picture, of course, much before, even long before that. He's not even mentioned at the wedding of Cana. So even before Jesus began his ministry, Joseph is not on the scene anymore. Evidently, he is dead at this point. And uh, then Mary, of course, is at the, uh, at the cross. She is there and uh, Jesus takes care of her by telling John to take care of her. And then uh, she is there um, in the upper room after the resurrection and right before Pentecost. But that's the last time you hear of her. Tradition says that John did take care of her and that they lived in Ephesus. And uh, that's where she died was in Ephesus under the care of John. But that's tradition. That's not in the Bible at all. So the Bible says nothing really about her. So through the years, it, this in, developed in the Roman Catholic Church. And so today you hear her called Mary, the Queen of Heaven, the Keeper of the Gates of Eternal Life, the, you know, the Queen of the Heavens and all of creation, all of these different names, you see, uh, she is assigned to those. And of course, uh, there's several uh, festivals or several uh, uh, days assigned to her uh, during the church year, which are special days of observance, and people are going to Mass on those days, and, and so on. We've got one coming up. 
What is it? March the 25th. March the 25th would be what? The Annunciation and the Conception. Huh? It's nine months before December 25th. Huh? That's why that day. So on March the 25th, there will be masses said and so on and so forth. And there will be a celebration of the Annunciation, as it is called. And uh, then, of course, eventually comes Christmas. Now, in the Lutheran Church, how do we view her? There's a day set aside for her, by the way, in the Lutheran Church, too. I forget which one. Uh, now, but there's a day set aside for her too. And the idea there is to simply recognize her as a good mother. And, and, and the scriptures do say that she will be called blessed. And Martin Luther always spoke of her too as the Blessed Virgin Mary, because that's what the scriptures call her. That she was blessed, especially above all women, to, to, to bear the Christ child, the very Son of God himself, and to raise him as a boy. My goodness, what greater blessing could any woman have than that. And so she is called the Blessed Virgin Mary. And Luther spoke of her in that way too. And so when we have her festival, of, uh, a day is set aside for her. That's what we talk about, her faith and her commitment to her Lord and her humility and all of those kind of things. Those are the things uh, uh, we talk about when we talk about Mary. She's a good example of a Christian lady and what, she, what a Christian lady as a mother should be in her commitment to the Lord and all of those kinds of things. Well, all of that then is connected with the Virgin Mary and, uh, and uh, her place in the church. Are there any questions about that or thoughts connected with that? Sometimes people coming into our church from uh, the Roman Catholic Church have a very difficult time accepting uh, um, that Mary is not uh, whom the church has taught she is. And uh, even Martin Luther later would write, because you see little children in the Roman Catholic Church are taught to pray to Mary, and they're taught that she watches over and takes care of them, and, and, um, and all these kind of things. And she's a special person, you see, and she's a special friend. And if you've been taught that since you're a little child, and a preschool child, little child, you see, then suddenly you come uh, to a class like this and, and you begin to question other things and you run into that. And uh, then, then you have these guilt feelings of turning your back on this very special friend to you. And uh, Luther himself said that later. You know, he said it took, it took him maybe a good 10 years. They didn't feel guilty about not praying, not praying to Mary. He had prayed to Mary, of course, as a little boy and all through. And he said, my goodness, it probably took 10 years before he stopped feeling guilty about not praying to Mary. And I've actually had people who have come into our church in, in my office when we've had our interviews and so on. We've talked about Mary and I've had people shed tears, you know, begin crying, my goodness, not to pray to Mary anymore. And she's somebody very special to them. And so that's a quite, it's quite, a, quite a leap, I guess you'd say, in, in uh, change in thinking, that you begin to think of her not as uh, just uh, this very special protector and person and so on, but simply as another sinner just like us. Most blessed lady, of course, but still a sinner just like uh, you and me. But that came about all through the centuries, over a whole course of centuries. Started all the way back in about the year 200. There might maybe be the first uh, indications of, of this might be something developing from this and that has grown through the centuries even today there are those who even are talking about she is a co-redemptrix i haven't heard about, much about that lately though at one point there was a lot of talk in the roman catholic church about mary even be co-redemptrix and that would mean this that christ is our redeemer and she is our co-redeemer but i've not heard much about that lady i think lately i think maybe that may be maybe put aside. Uh, I just haven't heard much about in any kind of writings. But uh, that had what, uh, that's the point to which it had gotten. But I think that uh, probably is, is by the wayside now. I, I don't know for sure, but I just haven't heard much about it recently. Any thoughts or questions about any of the, that I've said here then? <coughs> okay. The mediatrix of all grace. And that's because she was the one, it was through her that Jesus came to us. And then 
course that in itself even that in itself says there's a whole different idea about grace there's a quite a different idea about grace in the Roman Catholic Church over against in the Lutheran Church you see two different interpretations of what grace is grace in the Roman Catholic Church is something that God gives you and grace comes to you and uh, grace uh, in the scriptures is simply in the heart of God that's not something he does. His actions flow out of grace, but he does not give you grace, you see. And so that she then becomes the conveyor of grace is an idea which would be contrary to Scripture then too. Yeah. Because, because you have to realize that, that uh, in the Roman Catholic Church, the word grace is interpreted differently than ours. And, but you can say the same things and mean something quite different. So the Roman Catholic person can also say we are saved by grace through faith. And he means something quite different than we say when we say we are saved by grace through faith. Those two statements are quite different from a Catholic point of view and a Lutheran point of view, even though the language is the same. Yeah. How, is, how do we receive grace in the Lutheran perspective? It's not something that we receive. Grace is in the heart of God. Grace is simply God showing us love that we don't deserve. It's not something he does, gives us. In the Roman Catholic Church, grace is something that God gives to you and to me. And that's why a priest, for instance, uh, marries people. Because when the priest marries people, like, people receive grace to enable them to be better married people, you see. But that's, that's a whole different uh, viewpoint than but ours. Don't we receive grace to be saved? No, we don't receive grace. We are, become, we are the benefactors of grace. We receive God's gift of salvation, which comes from His grace, which is a love beyond our, beyond our comprehension. Yeah. Conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, now we're going to talk about suffered under Pontius Pilate. Jesus began His ministry when He was 30 years old. And sometimes people ask, you know, why do you suppose he waited so long until the age of 30 to begin his ministry? Because in those days, a person became a rabbi at the age of 30. That uh, it was considered that you did not know, you did not have the wisdom yet or the spiritual knowledge or the spiritual growth to become a rabbi before the age of 30. And so that's when rabbis became rabbis, was at the age of 30. So Jesus begins his public ministry at the age of 30. Sometimes I think that's so today, too, because I can remember being a, uh, a graduate of the seminary at the age of 25. And um, I think people kind of always looked at me skeptically, whether I knew anything at the age of 25 and was ready. And uh, then by the time I was 30, then something happens that they begin to accept what you're going to say. And I have run into that with the young pastors around me here. You know, they'll get a young pastor out at Nortonville, maybe, and, and he'll say something in the pulpit, and I'll see one of the Nortonville members downtown, and they'll say, um, hey, our pastor said this last week. Is that really true? You know, and they're always checking up on their pastor, too. And uh, that's just the way it is. That's the way it is in any profession, I think, too, isn't it? Probably in your profession, too. You know, you, you really don't uh, reach it. You have to reach a certain point before people really trust you. Yeah. I know it's that way down. When I go down to KU Med Center, you know, those residents will come in. But I want that guy with a little gray hair to come in after they've been there to make sure that what they're telling me is true. <laughs> you know? Well, Jesus begins his ministry at the age of 30. And right away, there's opposition. <laughs> and there's opposition because there are three groups that you're going to read about all the time in the New Testament that are giving Jesus, or in the Gospels, that are giving Jesus trouble. One of them is called the Pharisees. 
And the Pharisees were kind of the watchdogs of, uh, of uh, conservatism, very conservative. They're the watchdogs of Israel's traditions, and they don't want anything to change at all. And uh, the word Pharisee, of course, means separate, and they are separatists in this, that they want to make sure that uh, Israel maintains all of its traditions. They arose during the Babylonian captivity, and, uh, and they arose because they said, that we don't want ever to happen again what has happened here, that our people have drifted away from the Lord and drifted away from the scriptures, and uh, we're going to guard and protect so that that never happens again. So they're very, very conservative, but they also believe this. They don't believe in original sin, and they believe that you are born without sin, and they come up with a whole bunch of rules, 613 different rules that you must keep in order to get yourself into heaven. And if you keep these rules, so many positive and so many negative, um, then that's, uh, that means that you're holy and you're virtuous and you're worthy really working your way and are going to get into heaven that way and so on. Jesus is continually breaking their rules. You know, they have all these little rules, and he says, you know, this is ridiculous. That's not the way to heaven in the first place. And so he just kind of ignores their rules and breaks them. And so they're jumping all over him about that. And then right away there's opposition. And he begins to gain followers and that even causes more trouble. Then there are the scribes. And the scribes are the kind of professional theologian, I guess we would call them today. They study the scriptures and they're the ones who came up with the 613 different laws and gave them to the Pharisees. But the scribes are there to uh, also, uh, they are considered uh, great students of the scriptures and, and uh, Jesus is not uh, uh, following along with some of their interpretations, which are quite uh, off, the, off the record, I guess you'd say. And so they have trouble there too, or they bring trouble. And then there are the Sadducees, and the Sadducees are very, very liberal. Conservatives, very, very conservative. Pharisees, very, very conservative. Uh, Sadducees, very, very liberal. Sadducees don't um, believe in the scriptures. They believe that the first five books of the Bible are the only inspired books, that the rest of them are not the inspired word of God. And so the, the Pentateuch, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, uh, Leviticus, those are inspired, but uh, uh, not the rest of them. They didn't believe in heaven or hell. They didn't believe in life after death. They didn't believe in angels. So they're very, very um, uh, <clears throat> liberal and reject so much of the scriptures. And so they also then are contrary to Jesus because he does stick to the scriptures and uh, teaches the scriptures and so on. So these three groups right away are giving Jesus trouble. This because he's uh, not conservative enough and this because uh, he's not liberal enough and so on and so forth, you see. And you see that all the way through the scriptures, they are giving him trouble. And then, um, in different ways, too. For instance, you know, just to understand one incident, Sadducees come to him one day with this great question, and they say, uh, Jesus, how do you answer this? There was this woman, and she got married, and her husband died, and, and then she married his brother, and he died, and... Uh, he married the next brother, and he died, and had seven different brothers that were all, she was married. Now, who's going to be her husband in heaven someday? And Jesus says, you don't know the scriptures, that, that in heaven, that marriage is an ordinance here for this world, but not in heaven, and, uh, and so on. But they were asking him that question because they didn't believe in heaven, and they thought that would stump him. And Jesus simply said, you know, you're asking that question because you do not know the scriptures. And then the Pharisees, for instance, they jumped all over him one day because, the Pharise because he and the disciples were walking through this field and the disciples were picking some heads off of the wheat, you know, wheat heads. And uh, they were rubbing, those, rubbing them through their fingers and eating those uh, uh, wheat heads and uh, those wheat grains. And the Pharisees jumped all over him and they said, here you are letting your disciples do this on the Sabbath. They are working and in their estimation, the disciples, by picking those heads off those off the wheat grain, or the, picking the heads off the grain, um, were harvesting. And when they were rubbing those between their fingers, they were threshing. And when they were doing the whole process, they were preparing a meal. And then they were eating, of course. And that was all work. So they had all these different things. And see, Jesus then uh, just doesn't go along with any of that because it's so contrary to the scriptures. But they're just all over him because of these different things. And you read that over and over in the scriptures. Finally, what caps it all off 
And by the way, Jesus, that goes on for three years. Jesus' ministry lasts for three years. What caps it off is, is the, uh, there's growing opposition. They're saying, we've got to get rid of this guy. And then when he raises Lazarus from the dead, uh, that is the last straw. And they say, my goodness, because now people are really uh, coming to him and they say, it's time to get rid of this guy. We've got to get, uh, get him off the scene because uh, of what he's teaching and the following that he's getting and all of those kind of things. But one of them says, well, we can't do it now because of it's Passover time and, and Jesus is in Jerusalem at Passover time. But then um, a man by the name of Judas comes to, uh, to them and says, I will tell you where he is. And for 30 pieces of silver and Judas betrays him. We talked about this at the Lenten service two weeks ago, I think it was. And um, Jesus betrays where Jesus is. Jesus and the disciples, after the institution of the Lord's Supper in the upper room, go out to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's praying there, remember. And uh, Judas leads the temple guards and, and so on there to uh, the Gethsemane, and then he betrays Jesus, kisses Jesus to indicate who he is among the, in the crowd. And Jesus is arrested and so on. But Judas, evidently, he was one of the 12 disciples and evidently was looking upon Jesus as a kind of a military person. And that he would do something to bring Israel back to its former glory. And uh, so he betrays Jesus. Later, of course, regrets it terribly and takes his own life. Very, very sad story. But Jesus is uh, betrayed and arrested. This is on Thursday night late. And then taken to um, the palace of the ex-high priest, which is, his name was Annas. And uh, he does some questioning. And then Jesus is taken on to, taken on to uh, the high priest, whose name is Caiaphas. And others of the Sanhedrin are there. And they hold this court in the middle of the night and uh, condemn Jesus. A blasphemy is what they condemn him of. They ask him various questions. And finally get to the point, do you say that you are the son of God? And, and Jesus says, you say that I am. Yes, thank you, guys. Thank you. And uh, yes. And uh, um, Ask him that, and he yes, says that he is, and, and uh, they charge him with blasphemy. And blasphemy is uh, uh, punishable by death, by death. That if you blaspheme, then you are to be put to death. But uh, they don't have the power to put anyone to death. They are Jewish, and that power has been taken away from them by the Romans when they conquered the Jewish people some years before. So uh, they have to take him to a man by the name of Pontius Pilate. By the way, all of this is illegal that they're doing. In those days, uh, you know, it was like today. There were certain courts. You, you held court in a certain room. There were court rooms. And uh, there were court hours. You know, you had court between this time in the morning and that time in the afternoon. And there had to be witnesses. So they had the same kind of... Uh, uh, similar to our court system today. In fact, that's where our court system comes from is back in those Roman days. But, but uh, they, they break all the rules. See, they have court not in the court room. They have it in the palace, in the uh, living quarters of these uh, priests. And uh, in the middle of the night, and of course that's illegal, and uh, approaching Sabbath day, and that of course is illegal too. So they break all the rules about court and so on in order to uh, do to Jesus what they're going to do. But they can't uh, put him to death. But they sentence him. They say this man needs to die because he has blasphemed. He is speaking blasphemously. But they have to take him to Pontius Pilate because Pontius Pilate is the Roman procurator. And I talked about him last uh, Wednesday night in the um, Lenten service. Pontius Pilate, quite a, quite a character. He is the Roman governor at this time. And he eventually will sentence Jesus to crucifixion. But um, he's called Pontius Pilate. Pontius is his nickname. His name is Pilate, but he had been a Roman general. He had been a general in the Roman army. And uh, one of the uh, highlights of his career as a general is that there had been rebellion over in an area called Pontus, which is in what northern part of Turkey. And there had been rebellion over in Pontus, and they had rebelled against the Roman government, wanted to secede, and so on. And Pontius Pilate had, uh, or Pilate had led the uh, army over there and put that down very effectively, that rebellion. And uh, 
and uh, squashed that opposition. And after he did that, then he gained the name Pontius. That was his nickname, Pontius Pilate. The guy, he's, a, he's the general who put down the rebellion over in Pontus. So that's why he is called Pontius Pilate. Now, as it was in those days, if you were capable in the military and did some good things there, you could probably work your way into the civil government and work your way up in the civil government and uh, eventually maybe even uh, in Rome. But to work your way up through the civil government, you had to kind of start out on the fringes of the empire. And uh, Pilate is now going to do that. And he is sent to a place that nobody wants to go to as a governor because it's the worst place in the Roman Empire to have to govern. And that's Israel. And these Jewish people are are so peculiar when it comes to freedom. They want their freedom and they've got all these traditions and all these religious ideas and it's just a tough place to govern. If you can govern and make it in, in, in Judea, in Israel, you're, you're quite successful. And so Pilate comes now to this area and he's going to be the governor, the procurator, as they were called. But he's going to show these Jews uh, what it's all about and he's going to make a name for himself immediately. And he begins doing some very dumb things. For instance, he is going to, uh, when his soldiers march into Jerusalem for the first time, previous governors had never brought the standards into Jerusalem because these Jews had this idea about idolatry, that any kind of figure or figurine in the city of Jerusalem was was the same as idolatry, and you just never brought any kind of figure or figurine into Jerusalem. And so other governors would always leave the standards outside the city. The standards were these poles, of course, which the military used, which said, you know, what division you are and so on and so forth. But they always had an eagle on the top because that eagle, of course, was the symbol of Rome. Well, the Jews were just, uh, you couldn't bring those in. And previous governors wouldn't do that because they didn't want to upset the people and cause a riot. Pilate, though, said, I'm going to show him right off who's going to be boss here. And he marches into the city with the standards on high and the eagles. And, of course, there were riots. Riots on the first day that he's there. People are killed. It's a bad, sad scene. He keeps doing things like that. He, uh, the Jewish people had been saving money to refurbish the temple and uh, been doing this for some time. And Pilate learns about this and they need an aqueduct coming into the city and the Roman government isn't providing the tax money to build that aqueduct. And so he goes to the temple and gets that uh, money that has been saved for refurbishing the temple and uses that for an aqueduct. Well, you can see what that would do. Riots again. So he has these riots and, and, and riots about every little thing. He's always doing dumb things. And finally, it comes down from Rome. Any more riots and you're coming home. Your career is over. So in the stories in the scriptures where they are before, where the people are there before Pontius Pilate on that morning, and he says, I'm going to release him. They say, if you release him, we're going to riot. And they've got him over a barrel. Because as I brought out last Wednesday night, then it's his career or it is his um, or the, or the life of Jesus, or the life of Jesus. By the way, I don't know whether you're ever aware of this, but um, this uh, fear of any kind of emblem or any kind of figurine is why the Jewish people have no art. They never had any art. You know, if you go to the museum down in Kansas City, there are Rome, statues of Roman figures, and there's all kinds of art from the ancient world. And we know what Julius Caesar looked like, and we know what uh, Pompey looked like, and we know what Cicero looked like, because they made statues of all these people. They have no statue of any Jewish person because they never made statues, because they were so afraid of committing idolatry, and they had no art, they had no paintings, they had no statuary, nothing like this, you see. So if you go down to the museum in... Um, Kansas City, you know, you can find Babylonian art and Egyptian art and Greek art and Roman art, and you'll find nothing there in terms of the Israelites because they never had any art. They were so afraid of idolatry. What they gave to the world was not art. They gave to the world the scriptures, you see. And, of course, what a tremendous blessing that is. But it also explains, you know, why there's no art in the art museum from ancient Israel. It's quite a thing. That's different currently. I don't know. I don't think so. I don't know. I'm well, not. I'm not sure. The community center in Kansas City. They have lots of art, but it, it's 
and they had sculptures, but not maybe the way we're used to. I'd have to go back and Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I've been to uh, uh, um, synagogue, but I, I don't remember seeing anything there. I don't, so I don't know. Yeah, so. I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, that's, that all goes back to this time. Now, uh, so they bring him before Pontius Pilate, and Pontius Pilate, of course, realizes he has an innocent man on his, uh, uh, before him, and he wants to let him go free. They know that they can't charge him with blasphemy, that they'll never be, Pilate will simply throw them out of court. And so they come and they say, you know, what he's doing is he's uh, uh, going to start a revolution and he's going to make himself king and he's telling people not to pay their taxes. And they have all these political reasons. And Pilate questions him a little bit and he, he's uh, been around for a while and he questioned Jesus and he knows that Jesus is innocent and none of this is true. And he goes out and he says, I've got an innocent man here, I'm going to release him. And that's when they start crying out, crucify him crucify him. And Pilate then knows it's either his career or this innocent man. And so he comes up with these ploys to, to uh, get him released. And, and uh, he says, well, I'll release a criminal. And he brings before them Barabbas and Jesus and says, uh, here, uh, I'll release one of these men. Who will you choose? And he thinks for sure they'll choose Jesus because Barabbas is a terrible criminal, but they choose Barabbas. And then he says, well, if I beat him up, I mean, have him whipped and scourged and also all those kind of things, then maybe that will be enough and they will feel sympathy for him and they'll let him go. And so he has him scourged and whipped and he puts on a crown of thorn and the, and the purple robe and all those kind of things. And he brings him out before the crown. He says, now look at him. Is this enough? And still the crowd is shouting, crucify him. Because they've been stirred up by these enemies, the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees. And finally then Pilate says, okay. And he knows. When they begin, when they use that word riot and say, you know, if we don't crucify him, we're going to riot. And when, they hear, when Pilate hears that word riot, he knows now um, they've got him. And so he says, okay, I'm gonna, we'll crucify him. And he orders crucifixion. And he says, but I'm washing my hands of this whole thing. And, uh, and the guilt is upon you and upon uh, on your children. And they say, that's okay. Well, we will take the guilt. And, of course, then Jesus is taken out to this place called Calvary. And there he is crucified. There he is crucified. Um, the Bible does not go into the gore of crucifixion. Doesn't describe crucifixion at all, because everyone's going to know. Everyone knows what crucifixion is. They know how terrible it is. How just how very very terrible it is. So the. the it, the Bible has none of the blood and gore of crucifixion. What the Bible concentrates on is what Jesus was experiencing emotionally and spiritually. And so the Bible doesn't describe crucifixion itself. It simply says he was crucified. But it does tell you these things. It tells you that he was crucified at 9 o'clock in the morning and died at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And that's very significant. And they want you to know that time because it was at nine o'clock in the morning that a lamb was sacrificed every day. And it was at three o'clock in the afternoon that another lamb was sacrificed to cover the sins of Israel. And so Jesus, remember, is the lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. And so it's not accidental that he is crucified at nine o'clock and dies at three o'clock. Because that then is to bring an end to those sacrifices. Because the Lamb of God now has been sacrificed, which covers all sin once and for all. And then also at noon it becomes dark. There's dark darkness everywhere, you see. He is crucified naked too. So he's crucified at that time. He is crucified naked. They were always crucified naked. That was part of the shame that went with it. And then uh, the darkness... You know, and then everyone leaves. The disciples are not there and the friends leave and everyone leaves and there's only there his enemies. There's no friends there left anymore. And what's being pictured in all of that, of course, is hell. Jesus is experiencing hell. That he is not, that he's crucified between earth and heaven. He is suspended between earth and heaven. He has no place either in, on earth or in heaven. And all, all of that is pointing to he's experiencing hell because hell is darkness where God is absent and all the blessings of God are absent. So clothes are absent because clothes are a gift to God. The sun and light is a gift of God. That's absent. Friends are a gift of God. Family is a gift of God. All the gifts that God gives 
are now absent and gone. And all of that is, is to indicate that he is experiencing hell. And that's why then in the middle of the afternoon, close to three o'clock, he cries out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And he's, that's the cry of the damned. And he's crying out that. After that, then, of course, he finally says, it is finished. And what was finished was everything necessary for our salvation. He has lived a perfect and holy life for us. Now he has died our death for us. It is finished. The whole plan of salvation, the work of salvation is now complete. It is finished. And then he prays, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And then he dies. That prayer was the now I lay me down to sleep of that day. Every child was taught to pray when he went to sleep. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. So every mother would teach every child that, or every father would teach every child that prayer, just like most of us were taught, now I lay me down to sleep. And so Jesus prays that prayer that he first learned as a little boy uh, when he dies. Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And then says that he drops his, uh, you know, that his chin drops upon his chest. Um, <clears throat> he chooses the hour of his death. He dies for us. He is not death. Um, he is not killed. He decides when he will die, and when salvation plan has been complete. All of those kind of things. The Jews go to the, the authorities and say, they "Say we don't want uh, those bodies hanging out there." And so they come out. Uh, they send out soldiers to to make sure that um, these people are dead. And of course, they find that two of those criminals crucified on each side of him are not dead. And um, what do they do to those two criminals? They break, their legs. they break their legs. And why do they break their legs? To make sure they die. Yeah, to make sure that they die. So that, you see, you have to have your legs to push yourself up. When you die on a cross, how did they die? What, what killed you? Remember? You suffocated, huh? You suffocated because while you're hanging there on the cross, of course, your body is falling away from the cross. And all these muscles here are constricted and you can't get your breath and you have to struggle to get back up to get your breath. And of course, it takes your legs to do that. And you're doing this and you're falling away and you're going back and forth and back and forth until you begin so, become so weak that you fall away and you can't get back up and you die. So when they come along and break the legs of the soldiers, I mean, of these two criminals on either side of him, <clears throat> they cannot push themselves back up to get a breath of air. And so they die. But when they come to Jesus, they find out he's already died. And so what do they do? Pierce they his pierce side. his side. And out comes what? Blood and water. Blood and water. Why does the Bible tell you that? Because it wants to say he really, really was dead and already the blood had begun to separate, water and plasma had begun to separate, so that he really was dead, which counteracts all the theories of swooning and that kind of thing connected. There were those who said later, you know, he really didn't die, he just passed out, and then he came alive, and then he came to again when they put him in that uh, cool tomb, and the writers uh, then will make that, sh mention this for sure, no, he really did die, and that's why blood and water came out. Well, they took him and buried him then in a nearby tomb. And two Pharisees, who were secret followers of Jesus but had never let it be known before, now step forward. And a man by the name of Joseph of Arimathea and then Nicodemus, the man who had come to him at night and talked to him at night and to whom Jesus had said, for God so loved the world. That man, Nicodemus, now steps forward with his friend, Joseph of Arimathea, and they say, we'll buy the uh, embalming things, the, the cloths and the spices and so on, and we'll put him in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb uh, because he had a new tomb just made. No one had ever been in that tomb before. And he is a rich man, and so Jesus has died, dies between criminals and is buried in the grave of a rich man because only rich men could afford a tomb. You had to cut those out of solid rock, and you had that took a lot of labor, a lot of wealth to uh, do something like that, and, uh, and uh, that, uh, that he did. I have a whole lecture at home on tombs you know, in Palestine. Those tombs are still there. And uh, that was quite frequent back in those days. Those tombs were put into some very fancy, very fancy, fancy tombs that uh, the wealthy made for themselves. And, uh, but that's, um, that's where he was buried. Now, 
All of this, of course, was foretold in the Old Testament by Isaiah. And I want you to look back at Isaiah chapter 53 now. And uh, this is where all of this is foretold in prophecy. So look back at Isaiah chapter 53, will you please? On page 613, 613. <clears throat> 613 chapter 53 of Isaiah. What he's going to say is so fantastic. It's just hard to believe. And he begins with that. Look at chapter 53 verse 1. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? I'm going to tell you some things he says that are really hard to believe. But they are true. Because they come from the Lord himself. Verse 2. For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we, would, that we should look at him and no beauty that he, we should desire him. There was nothing uh, handsome or dashing about this uh, figure, this person, uh, just a very ordinary kind of person. But verse three, he was despised and rejected by men, a, pan, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. And there you can think of the opposition the Pharisees gave him and all those kind of things in his ministry. And then it comes down to the very end, and this is how it all ended. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. We esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. We thought God was punishing him for something that he had done. But, verse 5, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. My goodness. What he experienced finally was for us. Why? Verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He's the Lamb of God. Seven, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. I mentioned that in the sermon, in the Lenten services, that while everyone around him seemed to be losing their heads and it was just chaos, in the midst of all of it, he was quite dignified and a man of integrity and honesty and, and a man who was really in control of himself. Like a lamb that was led to the slaughter and like a sheep that was that before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. There was no protesting, no cursing, no none of that, even though he was suffering greatly. Verse 8, by oppression and judgment he was taken away. As for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. My goodness, taken away by oppression and judgment. There was nothing fair about the trials that he went through. It was all fake. And he was just cut off out of the land. But it wasn't because of anything that he himself had really done. It was for the transgressions of my people. Verse 9, And they made his grave with the wicked. He died between two criminals. And with a rich man in his death. He was buried in a rich man's tomb. Although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of God to crush him, he has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. And the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He's going to take upon himself our guilt. Hmm. That's what he's experiencing. And out of the anguish of 11, out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteousness, and he shall bear their iniquities. Because of what he does, because of the anguish of his soul, because of what he went through, we will be counted righteous. He's going to bear our iniquities. It's all for us. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. He will be counted among the great someday. Because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. He died like a sinner. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. 
It was all for us. That's all in, in chapter 53. Now, you can see that. You can see it so plainly. And when the early Christians began looking at this, they said, my goodness, how clear, how much more clear could it be? Mr. Cohen, last week, in talking to us, the man from Apple of His Eye, mentioned chapter 53 in his sermon upstairs, just in passing, and he said this, he said, my people, talking about the Jewish people, interpret that chapter as talking about Israel itself and suffering persecution. But he said, that cannot be. That's talking very directly about Jesus. That's talking about him. But he just said that in about a sentence or two. And so I think probably that went over the head of lots of people. But that's what he was talking about. How does the Jewish people themselves interpret this? They don't say that was Jesus. They say that was the nation of Israel and has, has had to go through all of these kind of things. But the early Christians look at that and they said, my goodness, that's Jesus. That's the Messiah. That's the Savior dying for us. Everything that he experienced finally was for us. And as you read through that, you can see it. All the different things that are said about him. Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. All that he suffered was for us and our salvation. Any thoughts connected with that or any questions connected with that? It certainly is clear, you see, and how our Lord set that down 800 years before it happened. That's Isaiah speaking 800 years before it ever happened. But the New Testament then picks up on that. And they said, you know, all of that was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Now we've come down to burial here. And I said that, I think, last week, that the, that the uh, Gospels, you know, spend about 25% of, of their time or their writing on these last days, Monday, th the last week of Christ's life, and then Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and then, of course, the last chapter of each uh, also talks about the resurrection. But it is such a huge thing, you see, is that he lived and he died for us as our Savior and as our substitute. And it's all brought out in the Gospels. The two things he did for you and for me is he lived a perfect and holy life for us, and that's all through the Gospels. And then he died our death for us, and that's what we've just seen. He didn't die for his sin, he died for our sin. See how that is all brought out so very clearly. Didn't appear that way, but that's what was happening. He was pierced for our transgressions. The nails were for us. That's for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that made him peace brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. How many of you have seen the movie The Passion? Yes, okay. Have you seen the movie The Passion? Yes. It's a horrible movie, isn't it? Yeah. Huh? Yeah, it's pretty, pretty awful. awful, yes. If you've never seen it, I don't, I don't know whether it's on television like it. Uh, it has been. Yeah, has it? Yes, but it's, it's terrible. We've seen it here. We've shown it here. We have it upstairs. I don't know whether we'll show it this year or not. But it... But it uh, it's a movie. You know, when I first saw that, there are scenes where you just have to, oh, you know, have to close your uh, eyes. And you just can't look. Huh? Yeah, and you just break down crying. And uh, there were reports in Kansas City, people coming out and and uh, throwing up. They get out on the street after seeing the movie and vomiting. You know, there were reports like that. That's how moving it is. That was made by Mel Gibson. And, of course, it ends. It shows you the, how terrible it was. Have you seen it, Brigham? Yeah. And uh, it shows you how terrible it was, the scourgings and all of that, the nailing, and just uh, so graphic. But it ends on, on the resurrection, but very little bit, just a little bit on the resurrection. And I just read this last week, where Mel Gibson is now making a sequel to that on the resurrection. Have you read that? Yeah, that he's making a sequel on that. The resurrection won't be out until 2020, they figure, but but it will go into great detail on the resurrection. He, and he realizes that, you see, that the Christ is risen and wants to just portray that in all of its significance. And so it must be quite a movie it's going to, if it's taking that long, you know, to be, won't be out until 2020. But uh, I imagine it will be very good. If it's as good as that, as the passion was, it'll be a tremendous, uh, tremendous movie. So we 
look forward to that 2020. Okay? Well, it's time to close. Next week, we will spend the whole two hours on the resurrection because that's the very center of the course and there is so much, you know, that's what, that's what it's all about, you know. If it weren't for the resurrection, we wouldn't be here. If it weren't for the resurrection, we wouldn't even know about Jesus. So that is such a tremendous, tremendous truth and such a tremendous happening that we'll spend the whole two hours just talking about the resurrection of Christ Jesus. Oh, I don't have a thing with me. Have you got yours all answered already? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. These are not so hard. Anyway, the Apostles' Creed points us to the two natures of Christ. His only Son, our Lord, points us to the, to the divine nature, that he is true God. Conceived and born point to his fact that he is true man, this human nature. The state of humiliation refers to our Lord's earthly life from his conception through his burial, right? His conception by the Holy Ghost was a miraculous conception to protect him from, who's got it? Original sin, original sin. While the scriptures call the Virgin Mary the most blessed of women, they also show that she was a sinner who needed a savior. Jesus was how old? 30 years old when he began his public ministry. It lasted about three years. And he called, I forgot to mention this, he called how many men to be his first disciples? Twelve. Twelve, right. Because of his teachings, Jesus soon came into conflict with the Pharisees, the Sadducees, I mean the scribes, and the Sadducees. After his arrest, Jesus was eventually taken to the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. <clears throat> he was put to death on a by, uh, he was put to death by crucifixion, crucifixion on a cross, on a hill called Calvary, which meant the skull. While on the cross, Jesus, the scripture records, he spoke, I forgot to mention this, seven times, seven times, not two, seven times. He was buried in a tomb owned by a man named Joseph of Arimathea. The prophet Isaiah in chapter 53 had pictured many of the details of our Lord's suffering and death. 